Today on CityCast Boise, Boise City Council unanimously approved the big shiny new zoning code rewrite last week, but what's in it and what the heck does it all mean? The Idaho Statesman's Ian Max Stevenson is here to give us a rundown, including what it could mean for your neighborhood. It's Tuesday, June 20th. I'm Emma Arnold, and this is what Boise's talking about. Hi, Ian. Thanks so much for being here on such short notice. Hi, Emma. Thanks for having me. So the council voted unanimously in favor of the zoning code last week with some slight tweaks we'll get into later. But this has been a long time coming, right? Like, what was the mood like at the end of the meeting when the vote happened? Yeah, this was an emotional vote for many up on the city council dais. It's been a years long process to get to this point. There have been hours of testimony and um, for more than 150 people last week. Uh, And before voting, council members described their personal experiences living in different types of housing as they've moved through their lives from houses in rural areas to living in accessory dwelling units or duplexes while attending college in Boise to then buying homes to raise families later in their lives. And multiple council members and the mayor were actually brought pretty close to tears by their votes. Uh, and one council member said that voting yes for this was the greatest privilege he will he will have. Wow. Yeah. And I saw uh, Lucy Willits, who uh, councilperson Lucy Willits, who more more conservative, kind of a surprising yes vote for me on that one. But even she said, I used to live in a double wide trailer. I know what it's like to be priced out of Boise. I think this is really important. So really, really interesting the way it kind of shook down and how emotional people were. So but let's talk probably the biggest topic in this is building more places for people to live that are affordable on Boise wages. Can you give us like maybe three things within the code that stand out to you with the goal of increasing affordable options for buyers and renters? Yes. So I think three parts of these regulations that stand out to me are, one, um, at least in theory, it will be easier to build small apartment buildings, so up to four units on basically any residential parcel in the city. So that means Boise's neighborhoods could see more fourplexes or cottage courts in the coming years. Um, And to get those extra units, some will either have to be affordable or they will have to be sustainable. So that means if they're affordable, Uh, They'll have to be rented at 80% of the area median income or less for renters, or if they're for sale, they have to be at 120% of the area median income or less. Uh, A second thing that I think is important on the affordability question is that it's going to be easier to build, also in theory here, uh, more urban apartment buildings, especially along corridors like State Street, Fairview, Vista. Uh, Some of this has been controversial because In order to to get to this point, the city is going to be reducing opportunities for public input on these types of projects. But by doing so, officials think that that will make it easier to build the kinds of buildings they want to see, which could, again, in theory, bring down the price of housing in general by getting the city more supply. And then a third thing that I think is important on the affordability front is changes to the rules around accessory dwelling units. These are those small homes that sometimes known as like a mother-in-law suite that people can build in their garages or their backyards. Um, first off, the, the new code allows them to be a little bit bigger than what's currently allowed. And second, it's gonna remove a requirement that the owner of the property that the accessory dwelling unit is on has to live on the property. And by removing that, it's The idea is that it'll be easier for those small homes, which often are more affordable than larger homes to be built. Mm, Okay, interesting. Which, you know, I I forget, I think maybe, again, it was Lucy Willits who somebody said at the meeting last night that, you know, a big chunk of this is reducing sprawl, you know, like letting things be built in Boise so that these other communities aren't having to deal with basically what is Boise sprawl in a lot of ways, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I've asked you this before, but now that we're at this point, I wanted to ask you again, given all the public testimony that happened last week leading up to the vote, does it really seem like, generally speaking, young Boise is in favor of this code while older folks are like more worried about it? I think that's an interesting observation. I would say that's true to an excerpt, to a certain extent. There's some of that pattern. But at the same time, there were a lot of older people really in favor of this. There were some younger people against it. So it's um, I think it's a little bit more complicated. But as a trend, I think you're pointing to something that's pretty interesting. And I think there are a couple of things at play there. 
One is a sort of a, I think, likely a basic economic reality, which is that older people often own their homes and they may not be facing the same types of economic woes that younger people are in terms of like skyrocketing rents over the last few years and trouble just finding a place to live that's, um, you know, close enough for someone to get to work. And then I also think that older generations, many of them have lived in Boise for decades. And as a result, they, they may be more invested in the city that they know and keeping the city they've lived in the same as it's been, feeling the same as it has for the years that they've lived here. And sometimes that means they might be more anxious about growth and change than than someone who's younger. Yeah, well, so after housing, another big thing in the code that came up uh, a lot is around commercial use. There's a lot of different facets of this, but one, the one I'm most interested in is about the neighborhood markets. I live in West Boise where, like, you know, you're basically forced to drive to get a loaf of bread. There's, no, you know, past <laughs> victory and amity, there's not a ton of choices. So is there a chance with the new code that a local business could open up in, like, a neighborhood market or cafe in, like the East End has with the Roosevelt Market? There is indeed neighborhood cafes and small markets will be allowed in most Boise neighborhoods under these new rules. So if you think about some of the coffee shops or little markets that are in Hyde Park, or as you said, Roosevelt Market um, in the East End, which are mere feet away from houses, more of those could start to crop up in other neighborhoods. And these will be the kinds of places that serve small menus of food, drinks, uh, and potentially retail too. And there's a lot in there about like how people move through the city, right? Like what can you share about how did transportation come up? Yeah, so public transportation is a big part of this. Uh, the city will be creating mixed, what are called mixed use zones along streets that have the most extensive bus service like State Street, Vista uh, and Fairview and in some other locations in the city too. And in those zones, what the city wants to see are mixed use apartment buildings going up and they want to bring denser living to those areas so that people can commute to work on the bus and sort of like the neighborhood markets, uh, but on a larger scale, the idea is for there to be stores and shopping in those mixed use buildings along with the apartments so that people don't have to drive everywhere to go to dinner, to get coffee or buy something that they need. And I know parking was a pretty hot topic during this process. So what changes are coming there? Parking is, is interesting. So in Residential areas, uh, which are now mostly single family areas, they are cutting re parking requirements basically by half, but there aren't as many changes coming to the sort of denser apartment type buildings in the mixed use zones, although there, there will be some incentives to get lower parking if you have a large number of, of affordable apartments, for instance. Um, but one thing that they will be doing for apartment buildings, and this was a change that um, just came in basically at the last minute, uh, is that there's something called a conditional use permit, which is in sort of planning speak, that's when that's when you ask for permission to do something. And the city's going to allow a developer to come in and say, hey, I want to build this apartment building, uh, but I don't think I need all of the parking that you all require. And here's why. And then the, the city will be able to evaluate that proposal and say yes or no. So it'll it'll give an opportunity for a builder of a large apartment to sort of go below what's required if they have a justification for why there aren't going to be as many cars needed in that in that building. Well, let's talk about a little bit like what's not in the code as it was voted on by the council, because they did make some changes. What stands out to you? Yeah, so a draft of these new regulations has been in place for months. And then the changes that the council's made came quickly over just a couple of hours last week. So the biggest one I would say is that they, they decoupled the affordability and sustainability incentives. So the city was gonna allow denser units in residential areas, denser uh, housing in residential areas, if uh, the building was made, some of the units were designated affordably and if it was made um, following some sustainability and energy conservation uh, incentives. Now, they've separated those so that a developer can pursue just the affordability incentive or just the sustainability incentive and still get that extra density. This, this came up, I think, because council members were worried that by doing them both together, it would be too difficult economically for uh, the developers to sort of make that come together on paper. And so they weren't going to get the buildings that have that more density. And so they pulled those apart to, to try to make it easier to, to, to happen. 
one thing that they also, another change that they also made was they slightly walked back some of the changes to public input uh, that, that, they, that came along with this code. This comes after there was a fair amount of negative testimony from members of the public about the public losing a voice in some of these development applications. So one thing that they decided to do is they're going to give neighborhood associations a bit more time than initially planned, uh, up from up to 10 minutes from five minutes to testify at, at public meetings. And in instances where uh, neighbors previously were not going to be notified about some development projects, they are now going to notify immediate neighbors uh, once those are approved. Another change that's coming uh, that they made at the last minute is that they walked back some of the, the density allowances in places where neighborhoods are right up against new mixed use zones. So some of the public testimony, there was concern that you would have a big apartment building along State Street, and then right behind it, you might have some single family houses. This is now going to try to make transitions between areas like that a little bit more gradual. Mm, okay. I want to talk with you about the politics of this for McLean and the other city council members, because, of course, there is an election coming up in November. So how important is this to the mayor and city council members agenda, like to get this done for voters? Yeah, I think that's an interesting um, question. I think in the case of Mayor Lauren McLean, I think she's definitely going to be running on this as part of her campaign message. I also expect some council members like uh, Jimmy Halliburton to to include this in their in their campaign message. I think both of them um, are happy with the changes and they think that it's going to uh, improve the city. And I think some other council members will run on it as well. But I, I also think it is uh, going to be a political issue in the sense that some challengers uh, in the city council races have already come out against uh, the code or at least some of the changes in the code or how the how the process of rewriting it went. Um, and McLean's leading contender for mayor at the moment, at least, uh, Mike Masterson, he has said that he's against the, the, the zoning code rewrite. So I do think it could be a political issue. Um, however, the the changes that are in this code are not going to they're not going to go into effect until December. Um, and they're also likely if they if they do cause changes, those could be, you know, months or years down the road. And so um, that's something in politics, you know, there are big changes in here, but it, it may be a while before people start to feel them out on the street. Could there be a big you know, I'm, I'm picturing November, you know, could there be a big political backlash to this? Like given the opposition we saw at some of the hearings uh, and and throughout the process. Or do you think that voters feel like this This is what you pro- you promised you would do? It's been a long time coming. Uh, given the given the testimony that, th- that they got um, during these public hearings, which was um, overall largely in favor of it, um, I think a lot of people want to see more housing units available uh, in the city. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see on that question. I think it's it's yet to be determined. And um, it's also yet to be determined whether whether they will really work, because these sorts of zoning code ordinances that cities have, they're really the framework for development. They don't require anything to happen unless the private sector comes in and builds things. So like with the affordability uh, incentives, we'll have to see whether developers take advantage of those. And if they don't, we won't see that many changes. And if they do, we'll see a lot of changes. So what's next then for the zoning code? Like, is it officially official now or does it have like a couple more hoops to, to go through? Yeah, so it is an ordinance and the city council uh, last week just voted to basically move it forward. So it'll still have to be read at multiple public hearings. And then they're going to set a um, effective date of December 1st. So that's when the laws will actually change over to these new regulations. Well, Ian, thank you so much. Uh, loved your articles on this. You've been keeping such a close eye on it. We appreciate you so much. And come back anytime. I, I can't wait to hear uh, <laughs> your election takes come November. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. And um, I'll be following closely to see what changes come with this code and and how it changes the city. One more thing before we sign off. The Idaho Statesman is reporting that home prices have increased more than $50,000 since hitting their lowest point over two years in March. The median Ada County home price is sitting at well over half a million dollars again. And in Ada County, the median home price in May was up $25,000 since April. 
that's all for today here on CityCast Boise. If you enjoyed the show, check out our Hey Boise newsletter. All the Treasure Valley news, info, and events you need right in your inbox every morning. We'll be back tomorrow with more local stories from around the city. Bye. Bye.